The Truth About Angels, Chapter 18, Angels from Pentecost to the Last Days. Angels Protect Vital Truths. I saw the angels of God were commissioned to guard with special care the sacred important truths which were to serve as an anchor to the disciples of Christ through every generation. The Holy Spirit especially rested upon the apostles who were witnesses of our Lord's crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, important truths which were to be the hope of Israel. All were to look to the Savior of the world as their only hope and walk in the way which he had opened by the sacrifice of his own life and keep God's law and live. I saw the wisdom and goodness of Jesus in giving power to the disciples to carry on the same work for which he had been hated and slain by the Jews. In his name they had power over the works of Satan. A halo of light and glory centered about the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, immortalizing the sacred truth that he was the Savior of the world. Peter and John Delivered from Prison A short time after the descent of the Holy Spirit, and immediately after a season of fervent prayer, Peter and John, going up to the temple to worship, saw a distressed and poverty-stricken cripple. The disciples regarded him with compassion. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. As the Sadducees, who did not believe in a resurrection, heard the apostles declaring that Christ had risen from the dead, they were enraged, realizing that if the apostles were allowed to preach a risen Savior and to work miracles in his name, the doctrine that there would be no resurrection would be rejected by all, and the sect of the Sadducees would soon become extinct. Some of the officials of the temple and the captain of the temple were Sadducees. The captain, with the help of a number of Sadducees, arrested the two apostles and put them in prison, as it was too late for their cases to be examined that night. Satan triumphed, and the evil angels exulted. But the angels of God were sent and opened the prison doors, and, contrary to the command of the high priest and elders, bade them go into the temple and speak all the words of this life. In the meantime, the high priest and those with him had called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel. The priests and rulers had decided to fix upon the disciples the charge of insurrection, to accuse them of murdering Ananias and Sapphira, and of conspiring to deprive the priests of their authority. When they sent for the prisoners to be brought before them, great was their amazement at the word brought back, that the prison doors were found to be securely bolted, and the guard stationed before them but that the prisoners were nowhere to be found. Soon the astonishing report came, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. As they, Peter and John, stood for the second time before the men who seemed bent on their destruction, no fear or hesitation could be discerned in their words or attitude. And when the high priest said, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Peter answered, we ought to obey God rather than men. It was an angel from heaven who delivered them from prison and bade them teach in the temple. Then were these murderers enraged, 
They wished to imbrue their hands in blood again by slaying the apostles. They were planning how to do this, when an angel from God was sent to Gamaliel to move upon his heart to counsel the chief priests and rulers. Said Gamaliel, Refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. The evil angels were moving upon the priests and elders to put the apostles to death. But God sent his angel to prevent it by raising up a voice in favor of the disciples in their own ranks. Philip and the Ethiopian Eunuch Heavenly angels watch those who are seeking for enlightenment. They cooperate with those who try to win souls to Christ. Angels minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. This is shown in the experience of Philip and the Ethiopian. This Ethiopian was a man of good standing and of wide influence. God saw that when converted, he would give others the light he had received and would exert a strong influence in favor of the gospel. Angels of God were attending this seeker for light, and he was being drawn to the Savior. By the ministration of the Holy Spirit, the Lord brought him into touch with one who would lead him to the light. When God pointed out to Philip his work, he learned that every soul is precious in the sight of God, and that angels will bring to the appointed agencies light for those who are in need of it. The heavenly angels do not undertake the work of preaching the gospel. Through the ministration of angels, God sends light to his people, and through his people this light is to be given to the world. Paul's Conversion As Saul journeyed to Damascus, with letters authorizing him to take men or women who were preaching Jesus, and bring them bound to Jerusalem, evil angels exulted around him. But suddenly a light from heaven shone round about him, which made the evil angels flee. In the record of the conversion of Saul, important principles are given us which we should ever bear in mind. Saul was brought directly into the presence of Christ. He arrested him in his course and convicted him of sin. But when Saul asked, What wilt thou have me to do? The Savior placed the inquiring Jew in connection with his church, there to obtain a knowledge of God's will concerning him. While Saul, in solitude at the house of Judas, continued in prayer and supplication, the Lord appeared in vision to a certain disciple at Damascus, named Ananias, telling him that Saul of Tarsus was praying, and in need of help. Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, the heavenly messenger said, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Ananias could scarcely credit the words of the angel, for the reports of Saul's bitter persecution of the saints at Jerusalem had spread far and wide. Obedient to the direction of the angel, Ananias sought out the man who had but recently breathed out threatenings against all who believed on the name of Jesus, and putting his hands on the head of the penitent sufferer, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. Paul Leaves Damascus as Paul preached Christ in Damascus, all who heard him were amazed. The opposition grew so fierce that Paul was not allowed to continue his labors at Damascus. A messenger from heaven bade him leave for a time, and he went into Arabia, where he found a safe retreat. 
Here, in the solitude of the desert, Paul had ample opportunity for quiet study and meditation. Jesus communed with him and established him in the faith, bestowing upon him a rich measure of wisdom and grace. Paul's labors at Antioch, in association with Barnabas, strengthened him in his conviction that the Lord had called him to do a special work for the Gentile world. At the time of Paul's conversion, the Lord had declared that he was to be made a minister to the Gentiles, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The angel that appeared to Ananias had said of Paul, He is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel. And Paul himself, later in his Christian experience, while praying in the temple at Jerusalem, had been visited by an angel from heaven, who bade him, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Cornelius and Peter The same holy watcher who said of Abraham, I know him, knew Cornelius also, and sent a message direct from heaven to him. The angel appeared to Cornelius while he was at prayer. As the centurion heard himself addressed by name, he was afraid, yet he knew that the messenger had come from God, and he said, What is it, Lord? Send men for one Simon, whose surname is Peter, who lives with one Simon, a tanner. And he told him the very place where Simon the tanner lived. Then the angel of the Lord went to Peter and prepared his mind for the reception of the men. Cornelius was gladly obedient to the vision. When the angel had gone, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. The angel was not commissioned to tell Cornelius the story of the cross. A man subject even as the centurion himself to human frailties and temptations was to tell him of the crucified and risen Savior. In his wisdom, the Lord brings those who are seeking for truth into touch with fellow beings who know the truth. Immediately after the interview with Cornelius, the angel went to Peter, who, at the time, was praying upon the housetop of his lodging in Joppa. It was with reluctance at every step that Peter undertook the duty laid upon him by divine command. When relating his experience, he does not defend his action on general principles, but as an exception done because of divine revelation and the result was a surprise to him. When Cornelius had related to him his experience and the words of the angel who had appeared to him in vision, Peter declared, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Peter Delivered from Prison the day of Peter's execution was at last appointed, but still the prayers of the believers ascended to heaven. And while all their energies and sympathies were called out in fervent appeals, angels of God were guarding the imprisoned apostle. Peter was placed between two soldiers and was bound by two chains, each chain being fastened to the wrist of one of his guard. He was therefore unable to move without their knowledge. The prison doors were securely fastened, and a strong guard was placed before them. All chance of rescue or escape by human means was thus cut off. Peter was in prison, expecting to be brought forth next day to death. He was sleeping at night between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison, 
And, behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Peter, suddenly awaking, was amazed at the brightness that flooded his dungeon, and the celestial beauty of the heavenly messenger. He understood not the scene, but he knew that he was free, and in his bewilderment and joy he would have gone forth from the prison unprotected from the cold night air. The angel of God, noting all the circumstances, said, with tender care for the apostle's need, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. Peter mechanically obeyed, but so entranced was he with the revelation of the glory of heaven that he did not think to take his cloak. Then the angel bade him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. No word is spoken. There is no sound of footsteps. The angel glides on in front, encircled by a light of dazzling brightness, and Peter, bewildered, and still believing himself to be in a dream, follows his deliverer. Thus they pass on through one street, and then, the mission of the angel being accomplished, he suddenly disappears. The heavenly light faded away, and Peter felt himself to be in profound darkness. But as his eyes became accustomed to the darkness, it gradually seemed to lessen, and he found himself alone in the silent street, with the cool night air blowing upon his brow. He now realized that he was free in a familiar part of the city. He recognized the place as one that he had often frequented and had expected to pass on the morrow for the last time. The apostle made his way at once to the house where his brethren were assembled and where they were at that moment engaged in earnest prayer for him. As Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. The same angel who had left the royal courts of heaven to rescue Peter from the power of his persecutor had been the messenger of wrath and judgment to Herod. The angel smote Peter to arouse him from slumber, but it was with a different stroke that he smote the wicked king, bringing mortal disease upon him. The Stoning of Stephen As he, Stephen, looked up steadfastly into heaven, a vision of God's glory was given him, and angels hovered around him. He cried out, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Angels During Paul's Ministry An extensive and profitable business had grown up at Ephesus from the manufacture and sale of small shrines and images, modeled after the temple and the image of Diana. Those interested in this industry found their gains diminishing, and all united in attributing the unwelcome change to Paul's labors. The whole city was filled with confusion. Search was made for Paul, but the apostle was not to be found. His brethren, receiving an intimation of the danger, had hurried him out of the place. Angels of God had been sent to guard the apostle. His time to die a martyr's death had not yet come. Day after day, as they, Paul and Silas, went to their devotions in Philippi, a woman with the spirit of divination followed them, crying, 
These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. This woman was a special agent of Satan. And as the devils were troubled by the presence of Christ, so the evil spirit which possessed her was ill at ease in the presence of the apostles. Satan knew that his kingdom was invaded and took this way of opposing the work of the ministers of God. The words of recommendation uttered by this woman were an injury to the cause, distracting the minds of the people from the truths presented to them and throwing disrepute upon the work by causing people to believe that the men who spoke with the spirit and power of God were actuated by the same spirit as this emissary of Satan. The apostles endured this opposition for several days. Then Paul, under inspiration of the Spirit of God, commanded the evil spirit to leave the woman. Satan was thus met and rebuked. The immediate and continued silence of the woman testified that the apostles were the servants of God and that the demon had acknowledged them to be such and had obeyed their command. When the woman was dispossessed of the spirit of the devil and restored to herself, her masters were alarmed for their craft. They saw that all hope of receiving money from her divinations and soothsayings was at an end, and perceived that, if the apostles were allowed to continue their work, their own source of income would soon be entirely cut off. After the woman had been freed from the evil spirit, she became a follower of Christ. Her masters saw that their hope of gain was gone, and taking Paul and Silas, they brought them before the rulers, charging them with troubling the city. This caused an uproar. The multitude rose against the disciples, and the magistrates commanded that the prisoners should be beaten. When they, the magistrates, had laid many stripes upon them, Paul and Silas, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. But the angels of God accompanied them within the prison walls. The apostles suffered extreme torture because of the painful position in which they were left, but they did not murmur. Instead, in the utter darkness and desolation of the dungeon, they encouraged each other by words of prayer and sang praises to God because they were found worthy to suffer shame for his sake. With astonishment, the other prisoners heard the sound of prayer and singing issuing from the inner prison. While men were cruel and vindictive, or criminally negligent of the solemn responsibilities devolving upon them, God had not forgotten to be gracious to his suffering servants. An angel was sent from heaven to release the apostles. As he neared the Roman prison, the earth trembled beneath his feet. The whole city was shaken by the earthquake, and the prison walls reeled like a reed in the wind. The heavily bolted doors flew open. The chains and fetters fell from the hands and feet of every prisoner. The Apostle Paul, in his labors at Ephesus, was given special tokens of divine favor. The power of God accompanied his efforts, and many were healed of physical maladies. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. These manifestations of supernatural power were far more potent than had ever before been witnessed in Ephesus, and were of such a character that they could not be imitated by the skill of the juggler or the enchantments of the sorcerer. As these miracles were wrought in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the people had opportunity to see that the God of heaven was more powerful than the magicians who were worshippers of the goddess Diana. Thus the Lord exalted his servant, 
even before the idolaters themselves, immeasurably above the most powerful and favored of the magicians. But the one to whom all the spirits of evil are subject, and who had given his servants authority over them, was about to bring still greater shame and defeat upon those who despised and profaned his holy name. Sorcery had been prohibited by the Mosaic law, on pain of death, yet from time to time it had been secretly practiced by apostate Jews. At the time of Paul's visit to Ephesus, there were in the city certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, who, seeing the wonders wrought by him, Paul, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. An attempt was made by seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests. Finding a man possessed with a demon, they addressed him, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. But the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Facts which had previously been concealed were now brought to light. In accepting Christianity, some of the believers had not fully renounced their superstitions. To some extent they still continued the practice of magic. Now, convinced of their error, many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Even to some of the sorcerers themselves, the good work extended, and many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together, and burned them before all men. These treatises on divination contained rules and forms of communication with evil spirits. They were the regulations of the worship of Satan, directions for soliciting his help, and obtaining information from him. A report of the speech of Demetrius was rapidly circulated. The uproar was terrific. The whole city of Ephesus seemed in commotion. An immense crowd soon collected, and a rush was made to the workshop of Aquila, in the Jewish quarters, with the object of securing Paul. In their insane rage, they were ready to tear him in pieces, but the apostle was not to be found. His brethren, receiving an intimation of the danger, had hurried him from the place. Angels of God were sent to guard the faithful apostle. As the chief priests and rulers witnessed the effect of the relation of Paul's experience, they were moved with hatred against him. They saw that he boldly preached Jesus and wrought miracles in his name that multitudes listened to him and turned from their traditions and looked upon the Jewish leaders as the murderers of the Son of God. Their anger was kindled, and they assembled to consult as to what was best to be done to put down the excitement. They agreed that the only safe course was to put Paul to death. But God knew of their intention, and angels were commissioned to guard him that he might live to fulfill his mission. This portion of history has been written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. The Ephesians claimed to have intercourse with invisible beings, from whom they derived their knowledge of that which was to come to pass. In our day, this communion with spirits is called spiritualism, and the arts practiced by mediums are not all sleight of hand, cunning, and pretense. The visible and invisible worlds are in close connection. Satan is the master deceiver, and his confederates in evil are in training under him to work in the same line in which he works. The Apostle says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, 
that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. That aged prisoner, Paul, standing chained to his soldier guard, presented nothing imposing or attractive in his dress or appearance, that the world should pay him homage. Yet this man, apparently without friends or wealth or position, had an escort that worldlings could not see. Angels of heaven were his attendants. Had the glory of one of those shining messengers flashed forth, the pomp and pride of royalty would have paled before it. King and courtiers would have been stricken to the earth. All heaven was interested in this one man, now held a prisoner for his faith in the Son of God. THE SIEGE OF JERUSALEM The long-suffering of God toward Jerusalem only confirmed the Jews in their stubborn impenitence. In their hatred and cruelty toward the disciples of Jesus, they rejected the last offer of mercy. Then God withdrew His protection from them and removed His restraining power from Satan and His angels, and the nation was left to the control of the leader she had chosen. Her children had spurned the grace of Christ, which would have enabled them to subdue their evil impulses, and now these became the conquerors. Satan aroused the fiercest and most debased passions of the soul. Men did not reason. They were beyond reason, controlled by impulse and blind rage. They became satanic in their cruelty. Satan was at the head of the nation, and the highest civil and religious authorities were under his sway. Angels of God were sent to do the work of destruction, so that one stone of the temple was not left upon another that was not thrown down. John the Revelator Of Gabriel the Savior speaks in the Revelation, saying that he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And to John the angel declared, I am a fellow servant with thee and with thy brethren the prophets. Wonderful thought that the angel who stands next in honor to the Son of God is the one chosen to open the purposes of God to sinful men. God had a special work for him to accomplish. Satan was determined to hinder this work, and he led on his servants to destroy John. But God sent his angel and wonderfully preserved him. All who witnessed the great power of God manifested in the deliverance of John were astonished, and many were convinced that God was with him and that the testimony which he bore concerning Jesus was correct. Those who sought to destroy him were afraid to again attempt to take his life, and he was permitted to suffer on for Jesus. He was falsely accused by his enemies, and was shortly banished to a lonely island, where the Lord sent his angel to reveal to him things which were to take place upon the earth, and the state of the church down through to the end. Her backslidings, and the position the church should occupy if she would please God and finally overcome. The angel from heaven came to John in majesty. His countenance beamed with the excellent glory of heaven. He revealed to John scenes of deep and thrilling interest concerning the church of God and brought before him the perilous conflicts they were to endure. John saw them pass through fiery trials and made white and tried, and finally, victorious overcomers, gloriously saved in the kingdom of God. The countenance of the angel grew radiant with joy, and was exceeding glorious, as he showed to John the final triumph of the church of God. John was enraptured as he beheld the final deliverance of the church, and as he was carried away with the glory of the scene, With deep reverence and awe he fell at the feet of the angel to worship him. The angel instantly raised him up and gently reproved him, saying, See thou do it not, 
I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The angel then showed John the heavenly city with all its splendor and dazzling glory. John was enraptured and overwhelmed with the glory of the city. He did not bear in mind his former reproof from the angel, but again fell to worship before the feet of the angel, who again gave the gentle reproof, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them that keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Christ, the royal messenger, came to John when on his sea-bound isle, and gave him the most wonderful revelations of himself. The mighty angel of Revelation 10, who instructed John, was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. Setting his right foot on the sea and his left upon the dry land shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. This position denotes his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. The controversy has waxed stronger and more determined from age to age and will continue to do so to the concluding scenes when the masterly working of the powers of darkness shall reach their height. Satan, united with evil men, will deceive the whole world and the churches who receive not the love of the truth. But the mighty angel demands attention. He cries with a loud voice. He is to show the power and authority of his voice to those who have united with Satan to oppose the truth. Angels in the Middle Ages In the thirteenth century was established that most terrible of all the engines of the papacy, the Inquisition. The Prince of Darkness wrought with the leaders of the papal hierarchy. In their secret councils, Satan and his angels controlled the minds of evil men, while unseen in the midst stood an angel of God, taking the fearful record of their iniquitous decrees and writing the history of deeds too horrible to appear to human eyes. The Protestant Reformation The banner of the ruler of the synagogue of Satan was lifted high, and error apparently marched in triumph, and the reformers, through the grace given them of God, waged a successful warfare against the hosts of darkness. Events in the history of the reformers have been presented before me. I know that the Lord Jesus and his angels have with intense interest watched the battle against the power of Satan, who combined his hosts with evil men, for the purpose of extinguishing the divine light. Luther While one day examining the books in the library of the university, Luther discovered a Latin Bible. With mingled awe and wonder, he turned the sacred pages. With quickened pulse and throbbing heart, he read for himself the words of life, pausing now and then to exclaim, Oh, if God would give me such a book for my own! Angels of heaven were by his side, and rays of light from the throne of God revealed the treasures of truth to his understanding. When enemies appealed to custom and tradition, or to the assertions and authority of the Pope, Luther met them with the Bible and the Bible alone. Here were arguments which they could not answer. Therefore the slaves of formalism and superstition clamored for his blood. But Luther did not fall a prey to their fury. God had a work for him to do, and angels of heaven were sent to protect him. Here was one lone man who had stirred the rage of priests and people. He was summoned to Augsburg to answer for his faith. He obeyed the summons. Firm and undaunted, he stood before those who had caused the world to tremble, a meek lamb surrounded by angry lions, 
yet for the truth's sake and for Christ's sake, he stood up undaunted and with holy eloquence, which the truth can alone inspire. He gave the reasons of his faith. They tried various means to silence the bold advocate for truth. They flattered and held out inducements. He should be exalted and honored. But life and honors were valueless to him, if purchased at the sacrifice of the truth. Brighter and clearer shone the word of God upon his understanding, giving him a more vivid sense of the errors, corruptions, and hypocrisy of the papacy. His enemies sought to intimidate him and cause him to renounce his faith, but he boldly stood in defense of the truth. He was ready to die for his faith if God required, but to yield it, never. God preserved his life. He bade angels attend him and bring him through the stormy conflict, unharmed, and he baffled the rage and purposes of his enemies. Had the eyes of the assembly at Worms been opened, they would have beheld angels of God in the midst of them, shedding beams of light athwart the darkness of error, and opening minds and hearts to the reception of truth. Melanchthon The reformer Simon Grinius had been on intimate terms with a leading papist doctor, but having been shocked at one of his sermons, he went to him and entreated that he would no longer war against the truth. The papist concealed his anger, but immediately repaired to the king and obtained from him authority to arrest the protester. When Melanchthon returned to his house, he was informed that after his departure, officers in pursuit of Grinius had searched it from top to bottom. He ever believed that the Lord had saved his friend by sending a holy angel to give him warning. The Pilgrim Fathers In the midst of exile and hardship, the Pilgrim Fathers' love and faith waxed strong. They trusted the Lord's promises, and He did not fail them in time of need. His angels were by their side to encourage and support them. And when God's hand seemed pointing them across the sea, to a land where they might found for themselves a state and leave to their children the precious heritage of religious liberty, they went forward without shrinking in the path of providence. The Three Angels of Revelation 14 Christ is coming the second time with power unto salvation. To prepare human beings for this event, He has sent the first, second, and third angels' messages. These angels represent those who receive the truth and with power open the gospel to the world. William Miller I saw that God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer, William Miller, who had not believed the Bible, and led him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one and guided his mind and opened his understanding to prophecies which had ever been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given him, and he was led on to search for link after link, until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. Angels of God accompanied William Miller in his mission. He was firm and undaunted. He fearlessly proclaimed the message. Although opposed by professed Christians and the world, and buffeted by Satan and his angels, he ceased not to preach the everlasting gospel to crowds wherever he was invited, and sound the cry, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. The instigator of all evil sought not only to counteract the effect of the Advent message, but to destroy the messenger himself. Miller made a practical application of Scripture truth to the hearts of his hearers, reproving their sins and disturbing their self-satisfaction, and his plain and cutting words aroused their enmity. The opposition manifested by church members toward his message 
emboldened the baser classes to go to greater lengths, and enemies plotted to take his life as he should leave the place of meeting. But holy angels were in the throng, and one of these, in the form of a man, took the arm of this servant of the Lord, and led him in safety from the angry mob. Many ministers would not accept this saving message themselves, and those who would receive it they hindered. The blood of souls is upon them. Preachers and people joined to oppose this message from heaven. They persecuted William Miller and those who united with him in the work. Falsehoods were circulated to injure his influence, and at different times after he had plainly declared the counsel of God, applying cutting truths to the hearts of his hearers, great rage was kindled against him, and as he left the place of meeting, some waylaid him in order to take his life. But angels of God were sent to preserve his life, and they led him safely away from the angry mob.